Welcome back to Module 6 and Chapter 29. In this second video out of three for this chapter, we are going to talk about the misconceptions around what the Big Bang really is. And so we're going to start out with a question not to check on our learning progress, but to see where we're at before we cover this topic. So I want you to really think about which of these answers makes the most sense to you. And if you've done the reading and remember some of the comments from the previous video, you might have already adjusted your thinking and that's fine. But I want us to think about which of the following we feel best describes the Big Bang. An outward explosion of matter and energy that threw matter into empty space. Two, an outward explosion of matter and energy that threw matter into regions of space where other matter existed. Or three, the expansion and cooling of the universe from an originally hot, dense state. So pause as long as you need to. Now, the real Big Bang theory is best described by option three here, the last option. There is absolutely no explosion of any kind, and it's a common misconception that we really have one particular person to blame. In the 1940s and 1950s, there were two competing cosmologies. The steady state model, which was primarily led by Fred Hoyle, and the expanding universe model, primarily supported by George Gamma. In the 1950s, there was a radio interview by Fred Hoyle and he gave it a, uh, he was talking about his much better um, model, the steady state model, and referred to the expanding universe model very disparagingly as the Big Bang. And British slang, if you start to think about that, that's an even worse nickname than we might think. The nickname stuck. George Gamma um, fought back in a um, written interview later and called um, the steady state model the little pop. The problem is, Hoyle's model has been proven wrong for decades. And so he has disappeared um, from the public conscious. The little pop model has um, disappeared from the public conscious, but the Big Bang stuck. Now there's a TV show named after it. We know about that phrase. It is a really bad nickname. Nobody who supported that model would have ever called it that. What we really should be learning about is the expanding universe model, but thanks to Hoyle and his flippant remark, we are stuck with a really poor nickname that does not describe what's going on. So, the expanding universe model. That already is a better fit because it tells us that the model describes a universe that is expanding. All right. So, the idea behind the Big Bang is that that phrase describes the initial moment in time at t equals zero seconds. In the first few seconds of existence, the universe was so hot that everything in the universe was just radiation, photons, instead of matter. It was extremely hot and dense for those first couple of seconds. Now, this plot, I want to take a moment and talk through. On the vertical axis, we have cosmic radiation temperature. That means how hot is the universe at all of its infinite points at that moment in time. At the bottom is zero all the way up to 10 to the 31st, which means a one followed by 31 zeros. We don't even have an easy billions, trillions, zillions um, term for that. Along the horizontal axis, we have the time elapsed. Now note that we've got 10 to the minus 43 seconds. That's a decimal point followed by 42 zeros and then a one. It is a tiny, tiny fraction, so small of a time that we would not be able to even recognize that amount of time has passed. All the way out to the light yellow, 10 to the minus three, that's still a millisecond. That's still too fast for us as human beings to fully process. So note that in a time that is shorter than it takes to blink, 
the entire universe went from this unreasonable extreme extreme temperature 10 to the 31 kelvin down to 10 billion kelvin still extreme but at least a number that stars are that hot as well okay so consider that if we think about the universe at its early moments the first second or two it's so hot that nothing can really exist and by first second or two, I mean first fraction of a second, it's so hot that nothing at all can exist. Over the next few minutes, and I'm talking like human scale minutes, over the next few minutes, it cooled off enough that we could go from pure energy, pure light, to actually building something. So we were able to build, um, electrons and positrons just by gamma ray photons hitting it just the right way. They can actually pop some matter and antimatter in equal amounts into existence. The problem is if ma matter and antimatter find each other, they will annihilate each other. That happens in the core of the sun. In a way that scientists still don't fully understand, there was a little bit more matter that was created in the first couple of moments than antimatter. That matter-antimatter imbalance is the only reason that you and I are here, me talking to a computer and you listening through some speakers or headphones to talk about all of this. If there was equal amounts, nothing would be able to build structure because everything would just annihilate each other. In the first couple of minutes then after the Big Bang, things cooled down enough to be around the temperature of the core of the sun. We already know what the core of the sun is doing. It's going through fusion, turning hydrogen into helium. If the entire infinite universe is that same temperature and roughly the same kinds of densities, even denser, then the entire infinite universe was also hot enough to turn hydrogen into helium once we had built some protons out of smaller pieces called quarks. After about three minutes, things cooled off enough that fusion was now no longer possible, and we were kind of stuck with the amount of stuff that had been made in that time frame. Okay? So now what we end up with is, if we think about going forward in time, it's kind of like going from the core of the sun outwards. Only the small center portion of the sun and other stars can go through fusion, the outer layers are just hot but not dense enough. And then at some point we get to what's called the photosphere for the sun. That's when light can freely stream outwards. It's the same kind of thing with the universe, but we have to wait long enough in time to hit that same milestone. And that took about 400,000 years. <laughs> so after about 400,000 years, we get to basically the same idea as the photosphere for the universe, where now all of that light was that was bouncing around and interacting with stuff is able to freely stream outwards. And when it does so, it's at a temperature of about 3,000 degrees, 3,000 Kelvin, kind of like a red star. So if that were all that's happening, then the entire sky should be awash in these red um, visible photons. Um, that we could see. Basically, the glow from the Big Bang. It's not quite that easy, though, as those photons have been traveling from about 400,000 years to now, they've been moving through an expanding universe. And the photons themselves have actually been expanding along with the universe. We now have a third type of redshift, a an effect that can cause wavelengths to go to longer wavelengths. The first type was back in chapter five. We talked about Doppler redshift and how Doppler redshift and blue shift are caused by the motion of light away from or towards an observer. You can have both redshift and blue shift with Doppler effect. Gravitational redshift was introduced very briefly in chapter 24 when we talked about black holes. If photons get kind of near a black hole, 
they can lose energy to that black hole. We had um, an astronomer, astronomer, an astronaut that was kind of being pulled apart through spaghettification, that diagram that was very unfortunate for the astronaut and it led into a reminder that it's not just people, it's also photons. That's gravita gravitational redshift. There is no gravitational blue shift. There's no object that is just like giving extra energy to every photon that passes by. And now we have cosmological redshift. This new phrase is underlined here. This is when photons that have been traveling for long distances are stretched out because the universe is expanding. It's kind of like stretching a rubber band that has a wave drawn on it or our balloon analogy here. There is no opposite. There is no cosmological blue shift because that would involve photons going through a collapsing universe and we don't have that. So in astronomy, we have three types of redshift, but only one type of blue shift. Please keep that in mind as we continue. Okay, so these photons are no longer visible light photons if they've been stretched to longer wavelengths and lower energies. We need to think about what it is we're looking for now. Before we do that, though, I want to remind us that we can think about time in the universe passing as if we're going through the layers of a star like the sun. We're at a point early on in the first second or two where everything's hot enough to go through fusion. After a couple of minutes, it's like we're in the outer layers of the sun where it's still very hot and the photons are bouncing around and not able to freely stream. And then at some point, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang rounding, we get to the same idea as the photosphere of the sun. The photosphere of the sun limits what we're able to visibly take pictures of. We cannot see the inside of the sun. And in the same way, we cannot see further back in time than this glow that we're about to talk about that came 400,000 years after the Big Bang. The book also likens it to a cloudy day. We know there's more sky above those clouds, but we cannot visibly see it. Now, when that cosmic background radiation was emitted, it was emitted as if it were a black body curve. We are still talking about the same kind of physics. The, the whole universe was hot and dense to make a black body curve that peaked at that point at 3000 degrees. It would have been like a reddish star, but now it's peaking at a much longer wavelength. So instead of visible, it would have shifted into the infrared. It's had so much time it's shifted further away. And so what we have is the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. That is a very important term and phrase, so it's worth writing down. The cosmic microwave background is basically the glow that we can still see of the Big Bang. It was first predicted in 1948 by George Gamma. We remember his name very briefly. We talked about him being the primary um, person behind the expanding universe model. But it actually took until 1964 for someone to discover it accidentally. The two men pictured on our slide here are Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, and they're standing in front of a huge um, communications satellite dish. They worked for Bell Labs, eventually part of AT&T, but Bell Labs was building this beautiful new satellite dish for communication purposes. And at the time, there was a lot of static that Penzias and Wilson were seeing in their signal. They did everything they possibly could to figure out what was wrong, checking all of the wires. They even scrubbed the inside of the dish for like bird poop um, and nothing was getting rid of this signal. They heard about someone down the road at Princeton University who was actively looking for this thing called the cosmic microwave background that would have a small tail of the um, black body curve would be producing photons in radio wavelengths, the same ones that um, Penzias and Wilson were picking up. So they quickly wrote up their discovery. Um, unfortunately for um, uh, Robert Dickey at uh, Princeton, and they won the 1978 Nobel Prize in physics for it. 
So the Nobel Prize comes with like a million dollars. And so that's not so bad for having to scrape out pigeon droppings from a satellite dish. The current cosmic microwave background peaks at a temperature consistent with about 3 Kelvin, 2.7 Kelvin. And I want us to recognize that the shape of the cosmic microwave background is exactly the same overall general shape as the black body radiation that we talked about in chapter five. Any hot dense object will produce black body radiation in some amount. That's um, human beings. We peak in the infrared and we don't make very much of it. The sun, it peaks in the visible and it makes plenty of light in this same curve that we've seen before. Um, incandescent light bulbs and the early universe was hot and dense enough to do this too. The cosmic microwave background peaks in microwave wavelengths and that's why it gets its name. Now at this point then, we have moved a couple of steps up in our ladder of understanding. This is the same picture that we had at the end of our previous video and now we're a little bit higher up this um, set of key ideas that we need to take out of chapter 29. So the yellow step started hot and dense. That is the single statement that we really want to make sure is in our mental framework about the Big Bang. There is no explosion. There is no single point that went outwards. The entire infinite universe at all points was hot and dense and over time it has cooled off and gotten less dense. That's the expanding universe model that got nicknamed to be the Big Bang Theory. And the glow that we see of the cosmic microwave background is absolutely key to being a strong piece of evidence to support the expanding universe model and to completely rule out the steady state model um, that Fred Hoyle was so proud of. Not many of us have TVs around anymore that um, are old enough that if you turn to a channel that doesn't exist, it's just that pure static um, from any dish that you might have outside. But for those um, older TVs, ones that aren't digital but um, picking up an analog signal, some of that static is actually the cosmic microwave background um, affecting the... Um, the signal. So it is possible to pick up the cosmic microwave background um, with the right equipment just on the ground on Earth the same way that Penzias and Wilson did. And it comes from every single direction on the sky because it's just showing us the leftover glow from the early universe. So a lot to think about in this video too, and I will see you in that last video.